introduce some aspects of Mongolian culture in this period as groundwork. Now, we will introduce the various tribes who played a role in the rise of the Mongol Empire. Our episode on introducing 13th century China provides some important context on the general overview of Mongolian-Chinese relations and details on the power vacuum following the fall of China's Tang Dynasty in 907 that I won't repeat at length here. In short though, parts of northern China and Mongolia came under the rule of the Liao Dynasty, ruled by the nomadic Khitans, a people related to the Mongols, beginning in the 900s. Their rule included garrisons and forts stationed throughout Mongolia, and mainly kept things in order for about two centuries, dealing with sporadic uprisings and resistance. One of the final military victories of the Liao Dynasty was the suppression of an uprising by the Tatar tribes in the beginning of the 1100s. Just over two decades later though, the Liao Dynasty disintegrated under the onslaught of the Jurchen, a Tungusic semi-nomadic people from Manchuria and ancestors of the Manchu. Their newly declared Jin Dynasty seized control of Manchuria, took control of all of China north of the Huai River from the Song Dynasty, and vassalized the Tango Shixia in northwestern China, but they did not make an attempt to control Mongolia as the Liao had done. With the Khitan garrisons moving west with the general Yeludashi to found the Kara Kitai Empire, Mongolia was basically left in a power vacuum, and the local tribes now rose into their own. When we describe the Mongol tribes in the 12th century, we are discussing a large, rather disparate group of clans and tribes some of whom were speakers of Mongolic languages, some were speakers of Turkic languages, and some were in a sort of milieu described by historians as Turco-Mongols, tribes perhaps ethnically Turkish, but speakers of Mongolian, and vice versa. By convention, we use Mongol tribes to refer to the various nomadic groups north of China but south of the Siberian forests. However, in this period, Mongol referred to just a rather distinct and smaller grouping in the northeast, in the region of the Onon and Kerulan rivers, the tribe to which the young Chinggis Khan belonged. So, if we were to place a clock face over the whole of Mongolia, they would be situated at about 2 o'clock. The other tribes of the region, who we will be meeting shortly as we go around this clock, such as the Merkit, Karyat, Tatars, and Naiman, did not consider themselves Mongol, and indeed, evidence suggests that they would have been rather insulted by it. A recent argument by historian Stephen Powell suggests that Tatar may have been the general ethnonym used by the steppe tribes. The Liao and Jin dynasties generally referred to them as Zugu. Either way, Mongol was, in the 1100s, a very limited term, and in the following discussion we will refer to the specific tribe and its subclans. The history of the Mongol tribe before the 12th century is not an easy one to trace, and the mentions prior to this period are often controversial. The most commonly agreed upon, though not a universal agreement mind you, is that the Mongols' ancestors were the Mengwu mentioned in histories of the Tang Dynasty as a minor branch of the larger Shi Wei ethnic grouping, a grouping which were vassals of the Gokter Khaganates until their final collapse in the 740s. At this time, they lived in the area south of the Amur River, which is today the border between Russia and Chinese Manchuria, and would have been semi-nomadic, relying on hunting, fishing, agriculture, and raising pigs as much as pastoralism. For a refresher on nomadic pastoralism, check out this season's second episode on Mongolian nomadism. During the 900s, the Mengwu moved west to the Argun River on the edge of modern Mongolia, becoming subjects of their linguistic cousins, the Khitan Liao dynasty. They gradually continued west and south, and were likely in the region of the Onon Kerulan rivers by the 11th century, by then relying on full pastoralism as pigs in agriculture are unsuited for the steppe. In the Mongols' own legendary accounts, preserved in the 13th century Secret History of the Mongols, their people originate from the union of the Blue Grey Wolf and the Fallow Deer, Borte Chino and Gua Moral. The entire ancestry from the wolf and deer down to Chinggis Khan is recorded in the Secret History, and we won't bog you down with it here. 
A particularly interesting conception occurs at one point where a ray of light, also translated as Yellow Man, enters the tent of one of Chinggis's ancestors, Alan Koa, and impregnates her, a sort of divine conception. At this section in the secret history, the most famous Mongolian parable first appears. Alan Koa, to prevent her sons from fighting each other, gives them each an arrow and asks them to break it, which they do easily. Then, tying five arrows together in a bundle, asks them to break it, which they are unable to do. The message was clear. Divided and alone, they are easily broken, but united, they are unbreakable. It's a famous passage for the Mongols, and for good reason, as its lessons was applicable again and again. The first of Chinggis Khan's ancestors commonly agreed to exist was Kaidu, who, in the secret history of the Mongols, is a great-great-great-grandson of Alan Koa, a figure who brought his branch of the Mongols, the Kiat Borjigon, to some prominence over other Mongol branches. Kaidu's great-grandson Kabul, with the fall of the Liao in 1125 creating a power vacuum in Mongolia, was able to organize what seems to have been a sort of military confederation, called by modern authors the Kamang Mongol Khanate, and at this time was known as something like Mongol Ulus, or Mongol State. Little is known about this early Mongol state, or what sort of suzerity its Khans exercised. What we do have takes the form of anecdotes. For Kabul, the Jin dynasty took note of his rise to power and invited him to the imperial court, intending to make him a vassal. At a feast at the imperial court, Kabul became incredibly drunk, went over and pulled on the Jin emperor's beard. The Jin emperor allowed Kabul to leave with his life, but changed his mind and sent officials to kill him. Kabul ambushed them instead. The Jin dynastic sources do not, unfortunately, provide direct corroboration for the above events, making it unclear if they were the stuff of legend, though they do remark on the Mongols being a nuisance along the frontier in this period. Kabul was succeeded as Kamag Khan not by any of his sons, but by his cousin, Ambaghai, a Mongol of the Taichiud line. Ambaghai, shortly into his reign, was captured by the Tatar tribes of eastern Mongolia, who, on our clock of Mongolia, would be located between 2 and 3 o'clock. Turkic tribes, speaking most likely Mongol, the Tatars in this period were, in three main divisions, an unruly control of much of eastern Mongolia. Even though Ambaghai had been en route to organize a marriage alliance with them, the Jin dynasty had gotten to the Tatars first, the Tatars acting as the Jin dynasty's men on the ground, disrupting local politics to keep the tribes from unifying. The Tatars handed Ambaghai over to the Jin, who nailed him to a wooden donkey. His dying breaths were allegedly urging the Mongols to avenge him. Until the nails of your five fingers are ground down, until your ten fingers are worn away, strive to avenge me. So began the decades-long rivalry between the Mongols and the Tatars, with the Jin dynasty as the puppet master behind them. Kabul's son Kutala succeeded Ambaghai, and though he was famous among the Mongols for immense physical strength and an appetite to match, over a series of 13 battles, he was unable to defeat the Tatars and was killed in about 1160, heralding the collapse of the Kamag Mongol Confederation. It must be stressed here that the Kamag Mongol was much more of a military alliance than a state in the form of the later Mongolian Empire. Though it held influence in the steppe, it did not hold dominion over the whole of Mongolia, but simply among those branches of the Mongol tribes, Borjigon, Taichiud, and the like in northeastern Mongolia. To quote Volume 6 of the Cambridge History of China, none of the available evidence even hints at the emergence at this time of any kind of administrative machinery or lines of authority independent of and in competition with the traditional kinship structure. The experience and memory of this brief unity may have contributed to the consolidation of the Mongolian nation, but it bequeathed nothing in the way of institutional foundations on which the later empire of the great Mongols could build. The preliminary work would have to be done anew. Over the course of one of these battles, one of Kabul Khan's grandchildren, Yesuge, captured a Tatar chief, Temujin Uge, 
Upon his return to his own encampment, Yesuge found that one of his wives, Holun, had given birth to a boy clutching a blood clot in his fist the size of a knuckle bone. The Tatar chief was sacrificed, and the boy was given his name, Temujin, the future Chinggis Khan. But you'll have to wait until the next episode for more on this story. With this brief history of the Kamek Mongol, we should quickly note the other clans of the Mongol tribe in this period. The two main to know are the Kiat Borjigan and the Taichud. The Kiat Borjigan are the clan to which Kabul, Kutala, Yesuge, and Chinggis Khan belonged. Of the Taichud lineage, Ambaghai was the most notable leader. The switching of the Kamag leadership between these two lineages sowed the seeds for future divisions. Ambaghai's family held a grudge when the title of Khan went back to the Borjigan, and this was one of the factors which led to the famous abandoning of Yesuge's family, which we will explore in the next episode. Other clans of the Mongols included the Jadaran, to which Temujin's blood brother Jamuka belonged, the Jurkan, and the Uriang Khat, to which the famous Subatai belonged. Subatai's Uriang Khat are not to be confused with the very similar sounding Uriang Khai, a northern tribe famous for reindeer herding. Now, continuing clockwise on our clock, if the Mongols were at 2 o'clock, the Tatars between 2 and 3 o'clock, then at 3 o'clock, we would have the Ongirad, a less warlike grouping which, in this period, was famous for the beauty of its women. Chinggis Khan's mother, Holun, his wife, Borte, and numerous wives for the rest of his descendants came from this tribe or its subgroupings. At 5 o'clock, we have the Ongut, close to the border of China proper. The Ongut were what the Jin dynasty called their Juyin, the tribes who made up their border guards. The Ongut were among those whose duty was to man the border defenses the Jin erected, particularly in the final years of the 12th century. This included forts and an extensive earthen wall and ditch along their frontier. The Ongut were given a chance to join a coalition against Genghis Khan, but chose to warn him instead, and their ruler was granted a daughter of the Khan in marriage, and soon submitted to him proper. Contrary to the description that Chinggis Khan simply went around the Great Wall of China, we might find it more accurate to describe it as being open to him by those appointed to man it. At 6 o'clock is the noted Gobi Desert, a sparsely populated expanse of gravel and low scrub brush. It was a formidable but not unpassable barrier, especially if an army chose to travel during the milder times of year. Connecting to the Alshan Desert, and the great western loop of the Yellow River, known as the Ordos Loop, it served as the divider between the steppe and the Tangut Shishia kingdom. From 6 o'clock, if one was to move towards the center of our clock face, they would encounter one of the most powerful tribes of 12th century Mongolia, the Karyat. Centered on the black forest of the Tul River, the Karyat may have originated as a branch of the Tatars, asserting their independence in the final years of the Liao dynasty, emerging as a distinct political body in about 1100. Though the Karyat were likely of Turkic origin, the sources indicate close contact with the Mongols and little trouble conversing between them, suggesting they were bilingual or spoke Mongolian. Much closer to the main trade routes and China proper, the Karyat were considerably wealthier than their northern cousins. Their population was higher, and perhaps surprisingly, they were Christians, or at least their ruling class were. Specifically, they were an Nestorian, or Church of the East, a sect which had gradually made its way east after being deemed heretical at the Third Ecumenical Council of Ephesus in 431. Several names associated with the Karyat, such as Marcus and Corjicus, were Mongolized forms of Marcus and Syricus. Indeed, Marcus Boyruk Khan was the Khanate's founder in about 1100, and Korjikus Boyruk Khan was his descendant and the father of the Khanate's final ruler, the famous Togro Ong Khan. When Korjikus died around the mid 12th century, his potent manhood, shall we say, left him the issue of numerous children, 40 by one account. Togro was able to seize control only after killing a number of his brothers with the military assistance of the Mongol Yesuge, the father of Temujin. 
Yesuge and Togirl swore oaths to be blood brothers, Anda, a relationship which would bring Temujin to seek Togirl's assistance in due time. Now back to the map. At 7 o'clock, to the west of the Tangut and the far side of the Gobi, we meet the Wagyrs, a mainly sedentary Turkic people. We mentioned them in our 